Hello, everyone. On this episode of Papers and Boards to Circuit Boards, Dungeons and Dragons Games. Dungeons and Dragons Games. Products of your imagination. It's become popular with children anywhere from grammar school on up. Not so with a lot of adults who think it's been connected to a number of suicides and murders. Along with the National Coalition of Television Violence in the States, BAD documents 28 cases of juvenile murder and suicide they claim are linked to D&D. If you found 12 kids in murder-suicide with, with one connecting factor in each of them, wouldn't you question it? And that's all people would do. I would certainly do it in a scientific manner, and this is as unscientific as you can get. It's nothing but a witch hunt. The good versus evil is white versus black witchcraft, and Anton LaVey, the writer of the Satanist Bible, says there is no such thing as white witchcraft. Well, being a Satan worshiper, he should know. And if they like, there are D&D video games, too. First published in 1974 by Tactical Studies Rules Incorporated, more famously known as TSR, Dungeons and Dragons is a fantasy role-playing game designed by Gary Gygax and Dave Arneson. It allowed each individual to create their own character for playing in an imaginary world full of monsters, mysteries, and magic. It also allowed an open playing style, with another player, called the Dungeon Master, being a storyteller, judge of actions, and controller of all other monsters and story characters. With all the freedoms of a massively open game like Dungeons and Dragons, how could they put something like that into a video game? What could be cut and what could be saved? Let's look back at some past games that tried to bring D&D to the CRT. The first type of D&D games we will take a quick look at are the dungeon crawlers. A dungeon crawler is a type of game in which players navigate a labyrinth-like environment while fighting monsters, solving puzzles, avoiding traps, and looting items, sometimes off of corpses. Some games allow players to create a custom party, usually up to four with a front and back formation, while other games only have a single character mechanic. Most of the time, inventory items and equipment can be given back and forth between characters in a party. Items such as rocks and bones can be more valuable out of combat than when used as a weapon, like when used to trigger traps and hold door switches down. Weight allowance and item skills may affect how the characters move and interact with objects and monsters. Narrow hallways and small rooms make up most of this style of game's level design, with hidden traps that can poison, do physical damage, or just drop you down a hole killing your characters instantly. Memorization and reloading of saves will become a habit for most new players. <laughs> Other common types of D&D video games are the grid-based combat system and the action side-scroller. Some games did try to combine multiple playing mechanics into their core gameplay. Our first featured game is Dragon Strike, a top-down shooter developed by Westwood Associates and published by FCI Pony Canyon on the Nintendo Entertainment System, taking place in the Dragonlance setting of D&D. It is your responsibility to bring freedom to the continent of Anselon from the conquering dragon armies. You start by picking one of the three dragons with different stats and attacks. After a difficulty select screen, a mission will appear with the goals and password for that stage. You can both fly low to the ground or high in the sky to avoid enemies and obstacles by pressing up or down on the controller. Turning is easy, but you are always in constant motion which takes some time getting used to. Power-up items will drop randomly from enemies giving you some of your life back or affecting your attacks and armor. Once the goals are completed, you will hear some music play, signaling you to fly to the top of the area screen, finishing the stage. Ground enemies stay anchored to one spot and just attack in your general direction. Flying enemies and air attacks are the real threat, with boss fights that use elements of both. Graphics are a mixed bag. On some stages, the landscape and enemies are clear from one another, and on other stages, some of them blend together, making it hard to focus. Sound effects and music are both average, with nothing standing out as really great or just awful. Dragon Strike is average fun in short one or two stage runs, but can be tedious on long start to end playthroughs. Hillsfar is an adventure game that has elements of side-scrolling action, free-roam exploration, 
text adventures, and basic puzzle solving. Developed by Westwood Associates Crosstalk and published by FCI on the Nintendo Entertainment System, Hillsfar takes place in the Forgotten Realms setting of D&D. You have a horse riding minigame when traveling from one area to another, which quickly becomes an annoying set of cheap shot events and just feels like padding in the game. The shops in Hillsfar have open and closed hours, but if you don't have the game manual with the open times listed, you will have to keep coming back or try picking the lock. When exploring homes or other buildings that are not locked, you can enter with no issues, but if you attempt to leave before the timer hits a specific mark, you are greeted with a message about the guards being outside and you'll need to wait for the exit to spawn. If you do get caught by the guards, you will lose the gold found in that area and sometimes you get tossed into an arena to fight. There is also an archery range to help earn fame and gold. Sometimes you will gain a helper that will work for you for some type of reward, such as this rogue that will pick locks for half the gold found. Graphics and sound effects are average, with the music being a rare commodity. Hillsfar feels like the start of a good D&D game with the exploring of areas, a nice large city with shops and guilds, and some story paths to take. However, it all plays out empty and dull. It seems your responsibilities are just to complete quests given to you by your guildmaster and to pick locks. Like something bigger is missing, and that something is a home computer. Hillsfar is more like a standalone expansion to the game's Pool of Radiance and Curse of the Azure Bonds, with the ability to import and export characters between computer versions. The NES only had Pool of Radiance released with no way of importing and exporting characters, making a standalone expansion style game like Hillsfar almost pointless. Iron and Blood, Warriors of Ravenloft, is a one versus one fighting game developed by Take-Two Interactive and published by Acclaim for the PlayStation. Based on the Ravenloft settings of D&D, you can play as both hero or villain characters. The main campaign mode has 16 champions to pick from. You choose either to be Order or Chaos based on the first character you select, after which you make a team of 3 to 6 based on your settings in the options menu. You will then be told what the match objective is. Match objectives are rewards given to you for winning the match. They range from magic abilities and magic items to gameplay mods like expanding your maximum team member limits. Artifacts can enhance your character with strength, knockdown resistance, and sometimes bring back a dead team member. Some stages, called backgrounds in the manual, can also give you a power boost. You can save your built-up characters to a memory card for continued leveling later on, or to take to a friend's house to play against their best fighters. Characters range from the unique, like the one-armed dwarf Torgo, to the seen it before, like Ardress the Skeletal Warrior or Sasha the Werewolf. The 3D graphics of the characters and the main fighting areas are average. The life meters, appearing as fires on the sides of the screen, make it hard to gauge your life during intense combat. A good old-fashioned standard life bar would have been a much better design. The backgrounds of the stages look bland, two-dimensional, and just rotate around the stage as you move. Sound effects are also average, with some mildly annoying voices. However, some of the music is amazing to listen to, and fitting for the game's mood, and then a track plays that sounds like it should belong in another type of game. Characters feel heavy and are slow to respond to most movement commands, while most of their physical weapon attacks are contrastingly fast and snappy. The computer opponents you face can mostly be defeated with random button mashing on the game's default difficulty settings. Iron and Blood could have been a great weapons-based fighting game, but poor execution of some great ideas hold it back. Next time, try using a hammer! Tower of Doom, released in 1994, and Shadow Over Mystara, released in 1996, are both arcade games made by Capcom. Both games are side-scrolling beat-em-ups based on the Mystara campaign, with the ability to have up to four players play at once. Tower of Doom has four different characters, Cleric, Dwarf, Elf, and Fighter, to play from, with only one type of each character allowed on the screen at one time. Why the races, Dwarf and Elf, are listed with the classes like Cleric and Fighter on the select screen left us mildly confused. The lineup seems more like a human fighter, a dwarf fighter, a human cleric, and an elf ranger. As your group sets out to investigate why the Republic of Darokin is under attack from monsters, you will notice little details from D&D rules are sprinkled throughout the game, like one gold coin being worth 10 silver coins, the cleric not being able to use cutting weapons or sharp objects like arrows, 
and the fighter's chance of spells hitting your target being more about luck than skill. You gain experience and level ups between stages. There is also an item shop that sells health potions or inventory items for some of the silver coins you found. Weapon combat is a bit slower compared to other beat em ups at the time, but not in a bad way, giving the game a unique feel of its own. Mildly annoying is your character's inventory located on the outer edge of the screen, forcing you to look away in combat while searching for the right item to use. Magic spells are called out when used, and some thrown weapons hit enemies both standing or on the ground. You can even pick up non-inventory items, like treasure chests, and throw them at enemies. At the end of some combat events, you are given a choice of story paths to take, giving the game a mild RPG element. Some stages even have backgrounds with doors that you can enter, leading to new areas, giving you incentive to return and play again on a new roll of quarters. Non-player characters will sometimes give you tips on an upcoming boss fight. Shadow Over Mistara is a sequel to Tower of Doom. In the two years between the games, some things were changed for the better. It now has six different characters to play from, with the addition of the thief and the magic user, and now has the ability to play two of the same class in a four-player group. Your inventory has been moved from the screen corners to a pop-up wheel around your character's head, allowing you to keep a better eye on things. You can gain new gear to wear, or earn new spells as you level up. The story, just like in Tower of Doom, has your group setting out to find new adventures, where once again monsters attack a village and you are asked to help find the cause. Graphics on both games are detailed and colorful, with equally good stage designs and backgrounds. From the simple things like different shopkeepers and monster animations, to more flashy things like spells and boss fights, they all equally add to a great play experience. Both the sound effects and the music still hold up to today's standards. Tower of Doom and Shadow Over Mistara are both great games with ports available on PCs and most home consoles. normal Saturday morning cartoon schedule will not be shown today as we now join the men's and women's mixed bag golf tournament already in progress. We know that in the case of Dungeons and Dragons, upwards of three million kids play the game with no apparent serious consequence. That for them it exercises the imagination and is just good fun. Dragon Strike is to be average fun that sounds wrong. <laughs>